Hey everyone, Richard Norris here. And in today's video, I wanna to talk to you about commercial valuations when it comes to specifically valuing HMO properties. Now, for those of you who are new to my channel and don't already know me, my name is Richard Norris. I've successfully built a multi-million pound property portfolio and my group of property companies does over 200,000 pounds a month. Now, if you are new to my channel and you haven't already subscribed, please go ahead and subscribe. Hit the bell icon so that you can be notified of any new content that gets um, released on a weekly basis. And also, please, I'd really appreciate it if you click the like button if you like the content in this video. With all that being said, like, um, let's jump into the video and we'll start off with like what we're going to cover today. So I've got a few notes here with me as well just to kind of keep me on track and make sure I don't digress too much because I, I do have a tendency to talk a lot and digress as well. So I really want to keep myself on track, okay? So here's what we're going to cover in today's video. So like, what is a commercial valuation? When is a commercial valuation used? And also like the common mistakes that property investors make when it comes to valuing HMO properties based on commercial valuations, the advantages of commercial valuations, and also the disadvantages of commercial valuations. And then at the end of the video, I'm gonna uh, take you through an HMO calculation and how to value that HMO based on a commercial value basis. Now, what you're gonna realize at the end of the video is there are a few ways to value a um, HMO property. One is by doing bricks and mortar valuation. One is by doing a commercial valuation. And it's not that simple and it's not that straightforward and different lenders use kind of different criteria to uh, assess the commercial valuation of the same asset. So it can make things a little trickier and more nuanced when we're trying to calculate the value of an HMO property on a commercial valuation. But when we get to the end of the video, it'll all become very clear. I'll take you through a granular calculation and I'll explain everything and we'll go through that together. So first and foremost, like what is a commercial valuation? Well, a commercial valuation is basically when you base the value of a property on the yield and therefore like the rental income of the asset and based on its performance as opposed to like the true bricks and mortar value. So basically when you have an HMO property, like you'll get rental income every month, obviously, so you get an annual, annual rental income. Now, what you do when you value a property commercially is you basically take the gross rental income and you, you times that by like a multiplier, which is usually in the form of a gross yield. So we need to know like, what is the rental income for that specific property in order to value it? So what you would do is you'd take your gross yield, and now you're, for those of you who don't understand how to work out your gross yield percentage, what you do is you take the gross rental income from that property, you divide it by the, uh, the value of that property, and you times it by 100 um, to basically get a percentage, and that is your gross yield percentage. Now, again, when we become to do the uh, commercial valuation at the end and we go through that calculation together, I'm gonna explain the yield and how the yield has a, a tangible effect on the uh, outcome of the valuation and how it really affects that because typically when you're valuing like a commercial property like it's kind of inversely proportional to like what we think in our mind right so for example like most people think the higher the yield the better the return on investment that is true when it comes to valuing like a uh, a residential investment for as a property investor but when you're specifically going on commercial valuations actually the lower the yield the higher the value of that property right and again like i'm going to explain that as we go through that calculation at the end so that's really what a commercial valuation is you're basically just um, basing the valuation of that property on its performance on the gross rental income and therefore the gross yield of that asset as opposed to the true bricks and mortar value of what that uh, uh, asset is worth, right? So like when is a commercial valuation used? Well, HMO properties are usually valued on a commercial valuation when they're classified as sui generis use. Now, again, for those of you who don't understand what sui generis use is, sui generis use is basically when you have seven or more shared occupiers. So there are unrelated occupants sharing basic facilities and amenities such as kitchens and bathrooms. So it's really seven or more people, right? And you have to go through a planning application when you want to basically put a new HMO property that's a, a sui generis use. You have to go through the planning application process, submit that, and then kind of get it approved and everything. And it's a bit more nuanced than just a general C3 to C4 residential kind of conversion, which you can do under permitted development, right? Now, most people think that in order to get a commercial valuation on a property, it must be uh, sweet generous use for an HMO to get valued in that way. Now that's not entirely true because one of the biggest mistakes that people make is exactly that. And they therefore think that they must have like at least six bedrooms ideally, but normally sweet generous use as I've just explained in order to get that commercial valuation. Now, 
you can actually get a commercial valuation on an HMO property that's less than six bedrooms or equally isn't sweet generous use, right? So you could even get a commercial valuation on an HMO property that's three, four or five bed property uh, or six bed, right? And the way that that works is it, is it really depends on the status of that property in question. So let me explain this to you. So rather than thinking about it in terms of the number of bedrooms, what you need to think about is how easily can this property be converted back into residential use class? Because that's what the valuation is going to be based upon. Like the, the more difficult it is to turn a prop, an HMO property back into residential use class, the more likely that you're going to get a strong commercial valuation, right? And you're actually going to get the commercial valuation in the first place, as opposed to that bricks and mortar valuation. So if you had like a three bedroom property, but all of the bedrooms were en suites and kitchenettes, then it's difficult to argue that that could easily be converted back into residential use class because what that would mean is you'd have to rip out all of the kitchenettes and you know go back to maybe three double bedrooms which have en suites right um so in that scenario the modifications of taking out the kitchens would be the nuance that means that it's more difficult to turn that uh, commercial property back into a normal three bedroom uh, residential property. So rather than the number of bedrooms, it's based on how each bedroom is being used. So I always like to say to my clients, like if you have a property and you have en suites and kitchenettes, then that's much more likely to get that commercial valuation. So like, again, the conclusion here and the point I'm trying to make from a summary point of view is that like, don't think about the number of bedrooms. Think about it in terms of what is the type of bedroom that you're kind of developing? What is the overall concept of that property? And therefore answer the question, how easily can this commercial property be turned back into residential use? And if you had five double bedrooms that are all on suites, that's gonna be a bit more of a gray area and you may get like a hybrid valuation. So sometimes you can get like a hybrid valuation between a commercial and a bricks and mortar valuation and you kind of get a blended approach between the two. Now, I know like Shawbrook and uh, Kent Reliance and Interpay sometimes view properties in that way that are like five or six bed properties with all on suites. So like I say, if you have all on suites and all kitchenettes, regardless of whether it's three, four, five, six bedrooms, regardless of the number of bedrooms, if you have all on suite and kitchenettes, you could easily argue that it's more difficult to turn that property back into residential use class and therefore it's much more likely to get a commercial valuation. Now, let's take a look at like what are the advantages of commercial valuations now that we know how to like um, value the commercial valuation in terms of like how do we get the commercial valuation in the first place and what do we need to do to the property in order to get that commercial valuation? Well, why do we do that? What are we doing it for? And what are the advantages of commercial valuation? Well, the main advantage of a commercial valuation is that typically speaking, that the value of your property will be worth more based on a commercial valuation as opposed to the bricks and mortar value. Now, that doesn't always hold true. There are some circumstances where the commercial valuation may be similar to the bricks and mortar valuation of a property or sometimes even less, but it's very unlikely. Most of the time, if you're going down the commercial valuation route and you have a decent rental income on the portfolio, um, or the property in question, I should say, then you're gonna get a, a higher valuation if you go for a commercial valuation. Now, what does that mean to us as investors and why is that a good thing? Well, if you're like kind of like wanting to grow your portfolio, so I always call it like in the hyper growth phase. If you're in the hyper growth phase of growing your property portfolio and therefore you're trying to get the maximize the, the value of your assets, maximize the growth so that you can pull more money out and take out higher returns on your investments, utilizing like a buy, refurbish, refinance, repeat process, then actually having commercial valuations is gonna mean that you're likely to get higher return on investment and you're likely to leave less money in the deals, which is good because it allows you to scale faster and it allows you to grow quicker. So that's the main advantage of commercial valuations is we're looking to enhance the value of the asset and appreciate the value of the asset above and beyond the normal bricks and mortar value of that specific property in question. Now, um, you know, that the other reason why we want to really get that higher commercial valuation is it allows us to leverage against the asset more. So like I was saying there, if you can leverage against the asset more, increase the loan to value to say 70, 75%, max out the loan to value at a higher valuation, again, you're 
by leveraging more cash, you're able to grow faster, quicker, and that's obviously advantageous if we're in the hyper growth phase. But there are some disadvantages and some drawbacks to commercial valuations. So like, what are the main drawbacks and disadvantages of commercial valuations? Well, the biggest disadvantage of a commercial valuation is that, to be honest, your interest rates are gonna be higher. Now at the moment and at the, at the time of this recording, obviously, interest rates are kind of at like a, an all time high that we've seen in recent times, right? We've been enjoying um, base rate between 0% and 0.5% uh, and now base rates like three, three and a half percent, right? So because interest rates are quite high at the moment, your commercial interest rates on your commercial valued properties can be significantly higher. Now, normally um, when you're valuing your, your HMO property commercially, your commercial interest will be about one to 2% higher than if you were to value your HMO via bricks and mortar valuation. So what do I mean by that? Well, if you were to value your property just on a sole bricks and mortar valuation, you're probably gonna be paying in a limited company around the five, five and a half percent mark, depending on your experience um, as an HMO investor. And if you're kind of getting it valued on a commercial valuation, your interest rates that you're gonna be paying at the moment can be anywhere between seven and 9%, right? So like 7% at best, 9% at worst. So like if you take the five and a half percent and say, what's the difference between the five and a half to seven, seven and a half percent, like you're around the, that one to 2% mark, right? So you should always expect to be like one, one and a half, two percent higher on your interest rate than you would be if you're on a bricks and mortar so therefore like that's a disadvantage to us because it means that our loans are more expensive uh, and therefore we're going to reduce the cash flow a little bit as well by having that higher interest rate to pay but it does mean that we can take more money out of the uh, property to expand because the commercial valuation and the higher that commercial valuation the more cash we can release to grow and, and keep scaling and buying more assets right so there's kind of like a balance to this right and so sometimes even even if I can get a commercial valuation, I may balance it and choose to get a bricks and mortar valuation purely because the premise I just want to, I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to take a lower return on investment and I'm really buying cash flow, right? I'm optimizing for cash flow as opposed to my return on investment and opposed to hyper growth. And I'll diversify my portfolio. So sometimes I'll go commercial, sometimes I'll go bricks and mortar, depending on what I'm optimizing for. And that's the key, right? When you're thinking about shall I go commercial or shall I go uh, bricks and mortar on my va valuation for my HMO property, you need to be asking yourself the question like, what am I optimizing for? If you're optimizing for maximizing your return on investment, then you probably want to go commercial valuation to strip out as much money as you can to continue to scale and, and to enable a hyper growth phase. And if you've already got assets in your portfolio where you've kind of leveraged against, you're kind of maxed out your loan to value at 75% and you've kind of been leaving little money in and taking a lot out, then I would encourage you to go more bricks and mortar valuation opposed to the commercial just to balance out the metrics across the portfolio as a whole and to make sure you're not over leveraging and putting yourself in a precarious position where if interest rates were to rise you, f you find yourself in a position that's not favorable okay and not profiting and not cash flowing at those higher uh, stress test rates of seven nine ten percent interest rates right so that's kind of how like I make my decision on whether I go commercial or HMO bricks and mortar okay like I say one of the other disadvantages of a Commercial valuation is not only are the interest rates higher, sometimes, and not all of the time, your loan to value is less, so you can borrow less. So typically you can borrow like 75% as like a maximized kind of loan to value that's acceptable as a buy to let investor. But um, on commercial valuation, sometimes some mortgage companies will say that the maximum we're gonna lend based on a commercial valuation is 70%. So not only do you pay a higher interest rate on the mortgage if you get a commercial valuation, but you also have the unfavorable outcome that you cannot maximize the loan to value and your loan to value is gonna be lower, which means that you have to leave more money in the asset, which, you know, again, stops you from growing as fast, right? So again, it really depends on what you're optimizing for. And then I would say that the biggest uh, disadvantage or the, the biggest nuance that you need to look out for is when you're like getting a commercial valuation on a property, that's a bit of a gray area. So I like to be real clear cut because like w when I'm getting my commercial valuations, I wanna know 100% that like I've got kitchenettes and en suites purely for the reason being that I know at that moment in time, if I've got a property that has kitchenettes and en suites, that this is nothing other than a commercial property. Like to convert this back into residential is gonna be a nuance and it is gonna be difficult to do. I'm gonna have to do a lot of modifications to the property. So there's no doubt in my mind that this is a commercial property that needs a commercial valuation. But if you've kind of got a hybrid approach, right? 
you can sometimes get a commercial valuation that's way higher than the bricks and mortar value of the property. And that can leave you in a precarious position because sometimes your 75% mortgage can actually be the same, if not more than the true bricks and mortar value of a property. And so if it's a getting valued commercially but it's kind of like that gray area where like you may have some en suites and some double bedrooms but it might be like a six or seven bedroom property and so again we're kind of in that gray area right between commercial valuation residential is it a commercial is it a residential it's truly a mix of both and that leaves me in a precarious position in my mind because the worst case that could happen in that scenario is that there's no longer for a demand for, for, for my product there's no longer a demand for en suites and double bedrooms within that postcode because the HMO market got saturated and I need to convert it back into a residential use class and ultimately if it was like double en suites and double rooms or just double bedrooms and it was a seven bed property the commercial valuation of a seven bed property may be higher than the true bricks and mortar value of a normal seven bedroom property on that road and that's likely to be the case when you're kind of in that gray area and you're not sure whether it's really commercial or whether it's truly residential right and the risk to that is that if the market does change and you need to value this residentially again then your mortgage is actually higher than the true bricks and mortar value of the property which means that you're in negative equity and that puts you in a precarious position because in order to get a new loan on the property you would have to significantly pay down the mortgage and you're going to have to input more cash in that position to basically get out of trouble right because uh, as i say if the if the loan is uh, that you've got on the property is higher than the actual bricks and mortar value of a property like you can see why that would be a problem right so that's the precarious position that you can be in when you're using a commercial valuation on a property that ultimately isn't a hundred percent identified as a commercial asset in my mind so that's what i'm thinking about as well when i'm making my decision of commercial or bricks and mortar right if you're a safe investor if you're a cautious investor then like i say if you want to go commercial definitely put those en suites and kitchenettes in and have a blend right or have all kitchenettes and all en suites because it's going to be much more a uh, commercial property and like the exit strategy, if you take out a commercial valuation, your exit strategy is no longer like threefold. It's like just one type of, of person that you can sell this property too and like you're not going to be able to sell this to a first time buyer you're not going to be able to sell it to somebody who just wants to buy the property as a residential and you're certainly not going to be able to sell it to an investor who just wants to rent it as a, as a residential property right you're only going to be able to sell the property to the to a, an investor um, based on the investor valuing and respecting the commercial value of that asset and looking at the performance of the yield and the gross rental income as opposed to the bricks and mortar value so that's like the downsides to the commercial valuations. So to conclude, downsides are, you know, the uh, loan can sometimes be higher than the true bricks and mortar value. So you have that kind of nuance if you need to go back to residential and you only have one exit strategy. For me, those are the main disadvantages, but the advantages are obviously if you're doing a buy refurbish refinance strategy you're in that hyper growth phase then commercial valuations are going to be your best friend because you can maximize the asset value and you can strip more money out so you can leave less in so it allows you to grow and scale which is quite nice okay so they're really the main points to consider when looking at a commercial valuation on an hmo property so now let's go over to the whiteboard and i'm basically going to go through a commercial valuation with you on how to value um, an hmo property based on a commercial valuation as opposed to bricks and mortar you're going to see some examples of like how I would value it kind of based on experience as well right because obviously I'm a property investor myself my clients we invest in HMO properties we get commercial valuations we see that sometimes lenders do a different type of calculation so for example Shawbrook or Interbay in a specific area may be using a different percentage when they're using their gross yield calculation uh, and that can have a big uh discrepancy and impact on what the value uh, that you expect to get as an outcome is going to be. So I'm just gonna go over to the whiteboard now. We'll jump in and I'll go through that commercial valuation with you. Okay, so let's go through the calculations and how to calculate uh, an HMO property based on a commercial valuation. So for the purpose of this example and for the purpose of the calculation and show you how this works, I'm gonna be using fictitious numbers, okay? So we're gonna say that this is a six bedroom property and it's got six double en suites with six kitchenettes. So each bedroom has an en suite and a kitchenette, right? So what we do is say that, let's just say for, the, for, for this uh, example that each room rents out for 600 pounds per calendar month. So for 600 pounds per calendar month is what each bedroom rents out for. So what we need to do is we need to find out what the gross rental income of this property is first and foremost. So what we do is we take the 600 pounds and then we times that by the number of bedrooms, which is six, which will give us our um, 3,600 pounds of 
of gross monthly income, right, on, on the rent for this property. So 3,600 per calendar month is what we receive in monthly rent from this property. Okay, so I'll put per month here. So then what we do is we take the 3,600 and we times that by 12. And the reason we times it by 12 is so that we get our annual gross rental income. So if you do 3,600 times 12, that gives us 43,200 pounds per year that um, we receive in gross rental income for this property. Now, remember that when we're calculating um, a property commercially and we're valuing it commercially, we must know what the yield is for that area. And we have to work out what different lenders or what the lenders are using um, to value the properties commercially in that area. So, and that will vary on area to area, right? So we're gonna say for the purpose of this calculation that in this area, the, the going yield is 7%, okay? So we've got a 7% yield in this area. So what does that mean? Well, what we do is we take the uh, 43,200 and we times this by a variable. So remember earlier in, in the video, I said that different lenders may use different parameters and different numbers. So basically what they do is they take a number between 0.75 and 0.9 and they basically uh, basically what they're doing is they're taking the gross rental income for the property and timesing it by either 75% to 90%. And the reason they're doing that is they want to basically take an allowance for like void periods in HMOs and turnovers, right? Now, again, different lenders like Interbay and Shawbrook and Kent Reliance, for example, um, have different numbers that they use and they can do that in the same area. So if we were in, say, an example like Peterborough or Oxford, we could go to Shawbrook, we could go to Kent Reliance, the same property, the same rental income and get a completely different commercial valuation using the same yield as an example and the reason that being is because like let's say one lender let's just say for example in this in, in this instance that Shawbrook says we'll take the gross rental income which is 3,200 and they'll basically take that gross rental income and they've times that by um, 0.75 so they're using 0.75 in their calculation which means that they arrive with um, a gross rental income for this property of £32,400, right? Which is your 43200 times by 0.75 gives us a value of £32,400, right? Now, then what they do is they say, okay, well, we take the 32400 which is the gross rental income after they've made an allowance for voids. They divide that by the yield percentage of the area. And if we're saying that they're using a 7% yield in this area, what they'll do is they'll take the 32400 they'll divide it by the 7%, which is the yield, and they'll value your property, therefore, at £462,857, right? Now, if we did the same calculation, but we used a different lender, and this lender said, actually, no, we don't take the 0.75, we make an allowance of 0.9. So then the same the same property with the same rental income could get valued slightly differently by a different lender. They'd still take the gross rental income of 43,200. That doesn't change. But rather than times it by 0.75, which is this number here, they times it by 0.9, right? And what does that mean? Well, if you take the 43,200 and you times that by 0.9, you actually get a, a gross rental income of 38,880 pounds, which is bigger than the 32,400 up here, which we used in the previous calculation. And in that case, they would take the 38,880 pounds, okay, and they would divide that by the 7% yield, because they're still using the same yield in this example that I'm giving you. But that meant that if they took the 38,880 and they divided by, by 7%, they would end up valuing the same property slightly higher at 555,428 pound. So the same property in the same location, achieving the same gross rental income, but valued commercially differently by different lenders because different lenders are using different parameters, can have a big discrepancy and a, a big disparity between those two numbers, right? One lender saying it's worth 462,857, and another lender is saying that the property is actually worth 555,428. And that, that is where, when you're doing your commercial valuations, where there is this little nuance of kind of ambiguity, because you know, you just don't know whether they're going to use 0 0.7, 0 0.75, 0 0.8, 0 0.85, 0 0.9, right? But you will get to know the more that you get to know the lenders of choice that you use and the more you get to invest in that area as well, okay? So the more familiar you get with the area, and this is where your research is so important, and the more familiar you get with using those lenders, you get more of an idea about how they calculate it. And so when you're calculating your numbers, you'll be able to get much more accurate uh, valuations based, based on the future outcomes that you want.
Now, whenever I'm doing my calculations for commercials, I'll just literally take the gross rental yield and I'll times it by 0.75. So I'll go on the low end. I'll lowball everything because if my numbers work at the bottom end, I know that everything else is upside. But if I go upside and then I get less than what I want and the numbers are tight on upside, then I'm in trouble. So I'm always very conservative. And if you just go on the literally the, the conservative side and always use 0.75 as your variable, then you're always going to be happy, to be honest, in my, in, in my opinion and for my ex experience of getting commercial valuations on HMO properties. Now, the other thing that may alter the calculation or change what it gets valued at, and this is another part of ambiguity and another variable, is that they may use a different yield. So again, you could have the same, you could have the same property, same rental income, but one lender says for that area, we're using 7% yield. And let's say the other lender says, hey, we're going to use an 8% yield. Look at the difference. So let's see what happens. So if we take the 30, 38,880 and we divide it by 8%, so we take the 38,880 Rather than dividing it by the 7%, we divide it by 8%. So we use a, a higher yield for the area. You can see if you do 38,880 divided by 8%, you end up with a valuation of 486,000. So the property is valued less. Okay, so up here, when we took the 38,880 and we divided it by 7% yield, we ended up with a valuation of 555,428 pounds. But when we took the 38,880 and we divided by 8%, so a higher yield, we ended up with a commercial valuation that came in lower at 486,000 pounds. So again, you can see like the considerable effect that the difference in yields and the difference in parameters and numbers that you use has on the outcome of the property. So again, like it's inversely proportional to how you think about it when you're investing on residential, where you're investing in those um, high yield areas for the high ROI. When you're investing in commercial property, you're investing in areas ideally where you have a lower yield because the lower the yield, the higher the valuation, the stronger the asset, the higher the capital growth, the stronger caliber of the tenant as well is what's linked to the yield when you're, uh, when you're doing commercial valuations. So hopefully this helped. Um, if you liked it, please go ahead and hit that like button. If you haven't already and you're new to my channel, please make sure that you subscribe. Click that bell icon as well so you're notified of any new content that gets released weekly. And guys, comment in the section below. Like, let me know what you're doing. Let me know what your commercial valuations are coming out at. Let me know where you're investing in the country for your commercial HMOs. Let me know what they were made up of, what the room types were. Was it a mixture of kitchenettes? Was it en suites? Was it all en suites, all kitchenettes and all en suites? What, what's going on? Like, comment down below where you're investing in the UK, what the yield is and what you're seeing and what the lenders are giving you. Um, let's, let's create a feed below. Uh, that'll be very insightful for people, I think, following this channel to kind of see how things are varying and, and how, how they're looking at different areas across the UK. So that's it for this video. Thanks so much for watching. See you in the next one.